In the late 1990s, Marvel were broke. Sales had declined, they were heavily in debt, and they eventually had to file for bankruptcy. In terms of Spider-Man specifically, they just finished this massive, overly complicated storyline that had left even the most loyal of fans uninterested to keep reading. And so, Marvel said, screw it. We'll start again. A brand new series, starting from issue one, that would reimagine Spider-Man's origin story for a new generation. They called it Spider-Man Chapter One. You see, Marvel have always been a bit lenient with their continuity, meaning that certain topical events can be subject to change. If the Punisher's getting too old to have served in Vietnam, they'll change it so he fought in Afghanistan instead. Sure, the story still works, just don't think about it too hard. Thus, Marvel sought to do the same with Spider-Man, to update his history while still allowing it to make sense in the original timeline. This, however, created a problem. Because it had to fit into the timeline, because it was bound by these old stories, it couldn't distinguish itself enough from the original comics. Like, the story's the exact same, but he gets a computer instead of a microscope. Like, yeah, real groundbreaking stuff, mate. In fact, because it was so desperately trying to justify its own existence, it made pointless changes that actually detracted from the original. Like, instead of Peter being poor because of his class, you know, a fundamental aspect of his character, it's now because Aunt May likes to go on spending sprees and uses rent money to buy presents. The series ended up a disappointment. It's not like it bombed or anything, but it wasn't the big thing Marvel needed. This soft reboot was soon forgotten, and left Marvel wary to do anything like this ever again until they did it again. Around the turn of the century, the big boys at Marvel knew they needed a hit, and so they looked at what chapter one got wrong and used what they'd learned to their advantage. This time, they weren't just going to do a simple retelling, but more a complete reinvention. A whole new separate universe, no convoluted lore, no having to abide by other stories, a perfect jumping on point for old fans and new readers alike. To bring this project to life, Marvel recruited independent writer Brian Michael Bendis and paired him with veteran comics artist Mark Bagley. Soon, the two got to work reinventing Spider-Man for the new millennium. The first issue followed a young Peter Parker as he struggled to survive high school, often ending up the target of bullies and being ruthlessly assaulted in the corridors for no reason. When school ended, he'd seek refuge in his family home, surrounded by his loving parent figures, Aunt May and Uncle Ben. One of the first proper changes to the origin story was the inclusion of MJ and Harry. In the original comics, Peter met them in college, and their friendship developed throughout his young adult life. In Ultimate Spider-Man, however, they're friends at school, and are implied to have known each other for a long time. Bendis also borrowed the changes from Chapter 1 that worked, such as Doc Ock being involved with the Spider-Bite, and the presence of Norman Osborn behind the scenes. But I'd say the largest difference between the original and Ultimate version is pace. Bendis being Bendis, took Spider-Man's 11-page origin story and stretched it to just over 130 pages. Half the time, there isn't even a plot. I mean, Aunt May baking Peter some banana bread isn't exactly integral to the story, but these kind of scenes work to establish dynamics between the characters, round out their personalities, and just let you spend time with them. Take Uncle Ben, for example. In the original comic, he shows up for no more than a few panels and then dies two seconds later. This new Uncle Ben has more of a presence. He's a bit of a smart ass, you know, he likes to tell the odd joke now and again. He's got a tough but fair attitude, he's clearly invested in his nephew's life and only wants what's best for him. He's around for so long that by the time you get to issue four, you almost forget he's gonna get executed in his own home. It's here that Bendis' style of storytelling really works in his favour. This early stuff, while it does feel like it's poking around a bit, works to enrich the more dramatic moments later on. Scale, spectacle, that's all fine, but if you want the story to really stick with you, you have to care. And you can only care if you had that investment in the first place. So Peter stops his uncle's killer and learns that with great power comes great responsibility, blah blah blah, we're all used to it by now. What people might not realise, however, is that this lesson of power and responsibility is the exact opposite lesson of the original comics. In Lee and Ditko's original story, Peter starts off as this arrogant victim of society who only cares about his aunt and uncle. His selfish traits are made worse when he gets his powers, and so when Uncle Ben dies and Peter is humbled, he makes a conscious choice to change who he is as a person. With Ultimate Peter, it's a different case. While this Peter can still be a dick and lash out at people, he starts off a little bit more thoughtful and empathetic. He doesn't just care about his aunt and uncle, he's got Harry and Mary Jane. He's willing to make peace with his bullies. When Norman Osborn sends an assassin to run him over, Peter doesn't even think of himself. His first instinct is to see if the assassin is okay. This Peter already has what he needs from the get-go, but when he gets bit by the spider and gets used to his new powers, he starts to become someone else. He starts playing sports, he goes to parties, he starts chasing money and fame with an amateur wrestling career, even though he admits to himself that he doesn't want to do it. After Uncle Ben dies, Peter's lesson isn't to change who he is as a person, it's to hold on to who he was in the first place in this new, ever-changing world. When he goes off and fights the Green Goblin for the first time, he's reclaiming his old self and fulfilling Uncle Ben's belief in him. 
These first few issues were a massive success. They weren't record breaking, but both critical and financial reception was strong, and gave Marvel the assurance that whatever Bendis and Bagley were doing, it was working. The series continued on its path, introducing familiar faces like Electro, Sandman and Shocker, each of whom had been redesigned to be less campy and more suitable for the early 2000s aesthetic. In other words, they either dressed them in black or made them naked. In the arcs that followed, the series focused on Peter's grief. After Uncle Ben dies, Peter doesn't seem to care. Sure, there's the initial outburst, but after the killer gets turned in, he's totally fine. He works on his web shooters, he's cheery at school, and it's like, Peter, your father figure is lying dead in the dirt and you're jumping for joy in your underwear. As the comic goes on, it becomes clear that this passiveness is just a coping mechanism. He can't hold back his grief for long, and so he starts sharing his dreams with ghosts. So what does he do? He tries to make things right. He does a background check on Uncle Ben's killer, which leads him to the kingpin of organised crime. Over these next couple issues, Peter develops an obsession with Kingpin, and vows to bring him to justice. This rivalry is really just Peter's way of dealing with grief, his attempt to fix the world that let his uncle die. But it doesn't work that way. You can't solve your pain by directing it externally, and Kingpin eventually finds a way to escape. Even when Peter has him dead to rights, there's always some legal loophole that gets him out of it. It's clear that in order to stop Kingpin and get through his grief, he's got a lot more work to do, both inside and out. To make Peter's life even harder, the Green Goblin returns and beats the shit out of him. His reputation is ruined after a Spider-Man copycat starts robbing banks, and to top it all off, Venom is born. There are some instances where the slow pace is maybe a bit too much. There's a whole issue dedicated to Spider-Man and Dr. Octopus on a plane, and Dr. Octopus is like, hmm, you're probably wondering how we got on this plane, and then it cuts to 11 pages explaining how they got on the plane. Him knocking Spider-Man out, then running away from S.H.I.E.L.D. agents, and then they're in the car, and then they go steal a plane, and oh, they used Rockefeller airfields? Oh, I would have lost sleep over that one, thank fuck you told me. But like I said before, this slow pace works, for the most part, to get you to care about the characters. Because despite the adventures being a bit wacky, the characters always remain grounded, they feel like real people. From the way he talks and acts, Ultimate Peter genuinely feels as if a real teenager got superpowers. Much like his 616 counterpart, this Peter is very susceptible to public opinion, and all the bad press really gets in his head. He suffers from self-doubt, thinking maybe the world is right about him and he's not suited to be a hero. The only way he can get around this is by not listening to the world, by shutting himself off from outside opinions, and having the courage to identify his own self-worth. To do what's right, no matter what people think of him. This is a character arc that is so prevalent in every piece of Spider-Man media. Comics, movies, TV shows, games. Overcoming self-doubt is so key to the character, and Ultimate gets it right. This Peter also has a temper, reminiscent of the later Stan Lee stuff where he'd just be pissed off all the time. I think having this long term rage is another vital aspect of the character, although Ultimate Peter will just get pissed off at literally anyone. His friends, family, teachers, bullies, enemies, the X-Men, Nick Fury. There is not one person he won't aggravate or insult or tell to off themselves. This is another flaw that gets in the way. Him losing his cool can cause relationships to break down, or him losing out on opportunities, or harming his reputation. It's a selfish impulse he must learn to control if he wants to improve as a superhero. But despite all his flaws, Ultimate Peter is still a caring, courageous young man who's in over his head. Which, at the end of the day, is what Spider-Man's all about. Any flaws he does have are challenged by his supporting cast, who are also well-developed characters in their own right. In the first couple issues, Mary Jane is not Mary Jane. She's another character wearing a Mary Jane skin suit. Where 616 MJ was this happy-go-lucky party girl, independent of male attention, Ultimate MJ is a slightly unpopular bookworm who gets jealous easily and is super awkward when it comes to romance. On a surface level, the two couldn't be further apart. But as the series progresses, MJ's core traits start to emerge. Like 616 MJ, she proves time and time again why they're so perfect for each other. She supports Peter through his grief, providing the strength and stability he needs to get through these dark times. Their love is pure and unconditional, they match each other's energy, and they both understand each other like no one else can. What makes MJ stand out from Peter's other love interests is how she's meant to test Peter's pride. In Ultimate Spider-Man, their relationship is often brought down by Peter's sense of responsibility. Him saying, oh, I can't be with you because you'll get hurt and I have to protect you and such and such. While he may have a point, this self-righteousness often leads him to neglect MJ and ignore her own autonomy. She has to prove him wrong, challenge his idea of responsibility, and make him realise that he needs her just as much as she needs him. I think that's Ultimate Spider-Man's biggest strength. Taking the original cast, putting them in a different environment with different personalities, but still keeping the heart of the characters alive. Aunt May starts off as this kind, caring old lady who we're supposed to take pity on, but over time we get to see her underlying strength. Because while Peter got his sense of responsibility from Uncle Ben, he got his indomitable willpower from Aunt May. 
Flash Thompson doesn't get to do much in Ultimate, but that's because his traditional arc is passed on to Kenny. Like Flash from the original comics, Kenny gives Peter a hard time, but is slowly inspired by Spider-Man to be a better person. Eventually he becomes a friend to Peter, and even becomes a hero in his own right. Gwen, despite being completely different from her original counterpart, still ends up playing the same role. She just ends up in the wrong place at the wrong time, and her death serves to teach Peter that sometimes tragedy strikes for no reason, and you can't let it undermine the good still left in your life. Around the issue 70 mark, Peter's getting used to being a superhero, and the price that comes with this kind of life. He's seen death up close more times than he can handle, and it's really getting to him. Peter's two identities go hand in hand, and one doesn't work without the other. Spider-Man is an opportunity for Peter to mature. It's this admirable, heroic version of himself that he must live up to in his day-to-day -day life. The feats he overcomes as Spider-Man allow him to develop who he is as Peter Parker. But it also goes the other way. If Peter doesn't have his shit figured out, if he has unresolved trauma and anger and drama in his personal life, the quality of his heroics suffers. Throughout these later stories, there's a very obvious theme of rebellion. The younger generation rising up against the old in order to create a better future for themselves, something that was a huge part of Stanley's original books. Now, Stanley was making Spider-Man during the counterculture movement of the 60s and early 70s. He was concerned with the issues of that time period, because that's what was shaping his young readers' lives at the time. While Ultimate takes place almost 40 years later and instead focuses on a post-9-11 America, the main idea is still the same. Whether it's the heightened security and surveillance in the form of S.H.I.E.L.D or rich guys like Norman Osborn or the Kingpin who profit off conflict. Whether it's J. Jonah Jameson who creates fear in the press, taking these complex issues and turning them into stories about good guys and bad guys because it sells papers. Peter's responsibility is not just to save people and do the right thing, but also be the voice of his generation. To stand up when no one else can, and use his powers to create positive change in a world that fights against him. In the original comics, Peter had the Fantastic Four and the Avengers to look up to. They were the good guys, fighting for a better world, and it was Peter's aim to join them when he was ready. In the Ultimate Universe, however, Peter is largely alone. The Ultimates are a government police force, they strive to protect the status quo rather than change it, and on top of that they're just a bunch of dickheads. On the rare occasion they they do interact with Peter, they talk down to him, treating his adventures as kid stuff. The Fantastic Four are also with the government, and sure, they might seem promising at first, but that kind of falls apart when one of them becomes a mass murderer. You have the X-Men, who have good intentions for the most part, but they seem to cause Peter far more trouble than they do help him. The only exception is Nick Fury, who hypes Peter up, recognises his gifts, but he's also waiting until Peter turns 18 so he can join S.H.I.E.L.D.'s paramilitary death squad. The ultimate superhero world is just another part of the old establishment that Peter must rise above. There's no standard to base his actualization on, so he must set the standard himself. The series is not at all subtle in its messaging. Half the time characters will just monologue the moral of the story right in your face, but that's the way Spider-Man's always delivered messages. Around issue 100, the series was still doing pretty well. We got the Clone Saga, a reimagining of that really long, overly complicated storyline from the 90s, which brought Gwen Stacy back from the dead and introduced the character of Spider-Woman. At this point, Peter was dating Kitty Pryde, a member of the X-Men. This was a fresh new idea, their relationship was really well written and they had good chemistry and it was all good and nice and wholesome, and then, during the Clone Saga, he cheats on her, forgets to break up with her, and gives her a half-assed apology afterwards. What the hell, Spider-Man? Don't get me wrong, 616 Peter isn't exactly the most perfect person when it comes to relationships. He's led people on before, he's been a bit of a homewrecker, but he's never outright betrayed anyone in his own relationship. He's generally respectful when it comes to that sort of thing, because his loyalty is one of his strengths as a character. Now, I'm not a massive believer in comic accuracy. I think the artists should be able to do their own thing and not be tied down by past interpretations of the character they're adapting. However, if you're not going to retain the core values associated with that character, why use that character in the first place? I guess the saving grace of this is that Peter is never rewarded for his behaviour. He acknowledges that he is a two-timer and that he does feel really guilty. His apology is not well executed at all, but I guess you could chalk it up to teenage awkwardness. And besides, he's forced to suffer the consequences for a long time. Peter is meant to be selfish and neglect his loved ones, perhaps not to this extent, but it's these kind of mistakes that let him mature as a person and allow him to forgive himself. So we'll give him a pass, so long as he learns his lesson. He does learn his lesson, right? Okay, so Peter's a bit of a bitch, but he makes up for it in the next story arc, in which he finally stops the Kingpin. Not by trying to get revenge, or using brute force, or telling fat jokes, but by looking inside his own soul. Daredevil wants revenge, and threatens Kingpin's wife, only for Peter to talk him out of it. Having largely processed the death of Uncle Ben, Peter's able to come full circle, and use what he learned to stop Daredevil from making the same mistake. With this, Kingpin is finally defeated, and meets the justice he'd managed to avoid for the past hundred issues. 
I also love the complete 180 Kingpin does. He's like, oh yeah, 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 I'll, I'll do whatever you say, Mr. Spider-Man, just, just please don't hurt my wife. And then the millisecond they leave him alone, he's like, I'm gonna blow up Spider-Man's school with all the children in it. Even his henchman is like, what? And then they get arrested anyway. These final arcs are what I would consider to be the tail end of Ultimate's golden age. Mark Bagley had said goodbye to the series and had passed the reins on to Stuart Immonen. Series long conflicts were being resolved left and right, and the comic was building to its natural conclusion. In one of my older, terrible videos, I spoke at length about Ultimatum, the big crossover event at the end of the first volume and the impact that it had on the characters. But what I really didn't focus on was the events that led to it. Everything starts off completely normal. Human Torch is fighting the Vulture and teams up with Spider-Woman, all while Peter and MJ are having a gay old time. The next day, Peter and his friends meet outside his house, excited to have a break from all the superhero stuff and just be teenagers for a while. On the surface, this is just a nice, wholesome scene. But if you read this knowing what's about to happen next, it's rather unsettling. Seeing these characters completely oblivious of what's to come, happily heading into mortal danger and they don't know it. Aunt May even throws in a friendly reminder to take shelter if it rains. Once Peter and company have left, things start to take a turn. The police arrive and Aunt May is arrested for her connection to Spider-Man. As she is taken away from her home, the colour starts to drain from the panels and the weather slowly starts to change. Over the next issue, the pressure on Aunt May keeps building and building and then suddenly… Darkness. The officers go to investigate and Aunt May creeps out into the light, finally revealing New York, completely destroyed by a massive, cold and uncaring tidal wave. I think the reason this tie-in works so much better than the main event itself comes down to a matter of perspective. Ultimate Spider-Man does what Spider-Man does best, which is providing a voice for the little guy, the everyman. While the main event is played out on this massive scale where everything is grand and bold and epic, Bendis shows what it's like for the people on the ground. It's a purposely narrow human perspective where everyone has no idea what the hell's going on and they're just trying to do the best they can in a dire situation. It feels less pessimistic edginess and more like hope persisting amid tragedy. Also, it probably helps that the uh, main event is dog shit, and literally anything else would have been better anyways. Despite Peter's best efforts, the number of people he saves is far outweighed by the number of dead. It's not long before he himself is lost in all the chaos, and he is presumed dead in the aftermath of the wave. It's here people get thrown off because the series just ends. There's no real indication where you're supposed to go next. It leads to a lot of people being like, is that it? He gets caught in a random explosion and just dies? Without realising that there's two more issues separate from the main run. Despite feeling a bit all over the place at times, the first volume of Ultimate Spider-Man can be viewed as one solid arc. You start off with this young man whose life changes drastically and he enters this new, exciting world. As he crosses further and further into this world, he leaves his old world behind and fights to build a better one for himself and others. In the second act, he goes through trial after trial, pushing him to his limit. He's tempted to give it all up and take the easy way out, but he persists, he gets through it and comes out the other side a more competent hero. Then in act three, he finds balance between his outer and inner worlds and is mostly freed from the demons who've tortured him in the past. He then must prove his new understanding by passing on what he's learned to others in need of help. As J. Jonah Jameson writes Spider-Man's obituary, he cements Peter as the standard for others to look up to. Peter's sacrifice unites the older generation with the new, inspiring them to stop fighting against change and rebuild a better world together. But the story of Spider-Man is never meant to be a tragedy. Despite how bad things get, there's always that optimism, that glimmer of hope. And as Peter is found in the wreckage and opens his eyes, that hope is restored. And then something weird happened. The series took a break for a bit and returned with a brand new issue one. We were presented with a time skip of six months, in which New York has been magically rebuilt and everything's back to normal. Well, I say normal, but Peter has mysteriously broken up with MJ yet again and is now dating Gwen. This is a bit weird given that there's been multiple times where both Peter and Gwen have likened each other to siblings. Like multiple times, like they really hammered that home. Now all of a sudden they're making out in the attic and the reason they got together in the first place is never really explored. I think what bothers people about this second volume, aside from the style change and you know, that, is that it was just getting a bit old. I've always said that change is a key element of Spider-Man, how Peter goes through different stages of his life and grows as a person. This new volume showed no signs that Peter had matured during the six months he'd been away. In fact, his maturity seemed to have regressed with the way he was handling the whole MJ Gwen situation. By now, the comic was almost a decade old and was caught up in its own status quo it had originally been created to avoid. There was some good stuff in there, but it was more of the same good stuff we'd gotten before. I guess while well, Peter himself doesn't get much development in this second volume, it more shows how Spider-Man as a concept can develop other people. Aunt May adopts the Human Torch and Iceman so they can have stable lives. Kenny rises up to protect Kitty from discrimination, and J. Jonah Jameson continues his mission to clear Spider-Man's name after witnessing his heroics in Ultimatum. This new volume was short-lived and ended with the story arc 
death of Spider-Man. While it perhaps didn't get the build-up it deserved, the arc itself is nothing short of amazing. After meeting his end at the hands of the Green Goblin, Peter dies surrounded by his friends and family, satisfied with the knowledge that he kept them all safe. It's executed beautifully and sincerely, and is an almost perfect send-off to a character that had been around for a decade. My favourite part isn't even the story itself, but the impact it had on the Ultimate Universe. Bendis has spent his time building up this supporting cast, building this world, and so to see everyone reacting to Peter's death, it feels like a payoff. The tears are earned. Bendis killed off Peter for two main reasons. One being because he could. Because it was the Ultimate Universe, where you could get away with that sort of thing, and such a death would be genuinely shocking and heartfelt. The other reason, of course, was Miles. Bendis didn't want Miles having to compete with Peter. He wanted him to be his own thing. And in order for it to really work, Peter had to go. I've seen people say that Miles is just Peter but boring, and I get that to an extent. This first version of Miles is not nearly as charming or as well-rounded as his Spider-Verse counterpart, but I think to dismiss him entirely would be unfair. When Uncle Ben dies, Peter vows to be a hero and to never let anyone come to harm under his watch. But Miles? He's like, fuck that! Miles is kind-hearted, he's got the right intentions, and he loves the short-term thrill of having superpowers. But the weight of Peter Parker's legacy is too much on him. His unwillingness to act doesn't come from arrogance, but fear. He confides in his best friend, not out of love, but of desperation. Spider-Man as a symbol has skyrocketed in the wake of Peter's death. He is celebrated by millions, the superhero world has been reshaped by his final acts. And what, Miles is just supposed to be this symbol? Miles initially overcomes this fear and becomes the new Spider-Man, but it's not that simple. He's just trying to prove himself to a world that wants him to be Peter Parker. He's going against his personality and doesn't have a proper understanding of what Spider-Man means, aside from the superficial stuff. Every solution to his problems boils down to either, hmm, what would Peter Parker do? Or he just uses his Venom Blast and wins instantly. This isn't helped by the fact that Miles has no real mentor. While Peter's uncle wanted him to expand his worldview, Miles' uncle wants the opposite. When he discovers Miles' abilities, he tries to corrupt his nephew, leading to a conflict that gets him killed. In death, Aaron is a mirror for Miles. He too had gifts, he was brilliant in his own way, but he never did anything with it. Instead of rising above Aaron's example and proving his uncle wrong, Miles takes it the wrong way. He takes Aaron's death as yet another reason why he's not suited to be Spider-Man. Then he's thrown into a massive superhero war, barely survives, and before he gets the chance to rest, Venom shows up. Yeah, in hindsight they could have used a better spelling for this one. In a devastating battle that takes the life of his mother, Miles loses it and quits being Spider-Man for an entire year. His guilt has gotten the better of him and he wants nothing to do with being a superhero, ignoring those who try and talk him back into it. Even when he's in the centre of danger, he does the absolute bare minimum and lets other people handle it. It's only when Spider-Woman gives him a long, heartfelt speech that he finally listens. Jessica is a female clone of Peter, with all of Peter's memories. She struggled with her sense of self-image, at first unable to see herself as more than just an echo, but she eventually carved out her own identity. She's similar to Miles in that she never asked for any of this, except she's got over herself and is doing everything she can to help. Jessica is the proof Miles needs to get back up, proof that he doesn't have to let his guilt nor anyone's expectations define him. Jessica isn't forcing him to do anything, she's just supporting Miles' own decision. With all of this, Miles finds his purpose, and is finally able to take ownership of his secret identity. He's being Spider-Man not as an answer to other people, but as a duty to himself. There will always be a Spider-Man, because it's such a natural response to evil. Compassion, perseverance, bravery, these traits aren't created in a lab, they don't require anything but a good heart. These men of science who try and corrupt nature, these people who try and oppress and take away freedoms, they are nothing compared to the purity of the human spirit. Take one person away, it doesn't matter. The vacuum will always be filled because the symbol of good nature extends beyond any one individual. Miles' initial story isn't groundbreaking or anything, but it still carries forward all of the values Spider-Man's supposed to represent. And as he stands triumphant at the end of his first run, he's proof that these values will live on, no matter how hard some may try to repress them. After Miles' first volume, we got another crossover. Big end of the world stuff, don't worry about it. And then the series was relaunched yet again with Miles Morales the Ultimate Spider-Man. This one makes me want to eat my own shoe. Firstly, Peter Parker comes back out of nowhere, which not only undermines his sacrifice but is also never elaborated on because he just f**ks off after a few issues. The story feels like it's prioritising mystery and spectacle and oh look, Peter Parker's back over like actual story. It definitely has a lot of potential, but it's squandered by the fact that these setups never have satisfying payoffs. Characters are killed off randomly, which is not exactly a new thing, but these deaths don't serve to teach the other characters anything. They just happen for the sake of shock value. Oh, it's J. Jonah Jameson. I like him. Yeah, I like this character arc. Can't wait to see what they do with him next. Oh, his head got incinerated. 
Huh. The reason these deaths don't work, and really the whole story for that matter, is down to a lack of weight. Ultimate Spider-Man used to be grounded, it used to prioritise real investment and emotional weight over scalar spectacle. Now it was doing the exact opposite. This wasn't a problem exclusive to this volume either, the symptoms had been showing for a while now. As time passed since its beginning, the series had introduced these increasingly convoluted plotlines and opportunities to undo what had come before. Its groundedness was being slowly chipped away, with each death and resurrection and magical time skip. Decisions seemed like they were made for the sake of drama, rather than what the characters would actually do. Then there was a real opportunity to re-establish this weight, but it was eventually wasted. It gets to the point where the story feels weightless. Osborne is resurrected for the zillionth time, Peter is revealed to be immortal, and then at the end they crank it up to 11, when Miles is thrown into Earth 616 and his entire personal history is rewritten. His mother is still alive, his uncle is still alive, and the only thing that remains dead is my investment in the series. Again, that's not to say there's not good stuff in there. There are some great moments, the themes are carried through, through, but as a whole it just feels stagnant. Ultimate Spider-Man was now just another comic book, with your typical comic book deaths and your typical comic book plot twists. I can appreciate that some of this probably wasn't Bendis' intention. I can imagine him getting a phone call from Marvel being like, yeah, your universe is getting blown up in like five minutes, good luck trying to finish all your plot lines, but that's just speculation. I hate to end on a low note, so what I will say is that, as a whole, Ultimate Spider-Man has far more good than bad. Even the parts that were disappointing served as a blueprint for some of the best Spider-Man stories we've had in a long time, and regardless of your own opinion, I think we can all agree that it's better than whatever the f they're doing now. Vindicated. I am selfish, I am wrong.